We want to welcome everyone to our keynote speech this afternoon. Please take a seat if you can. My name is Mark Fick. I'm the Director of Lending with North Country Cooperative Development Fund. And I'm Christina Jennings, and I'm the Executive Director of North Country Cooperative Development Fund. We've been asked to give a brief introduction to our keynote speaker, uh, who I think you all know now is Steve Dubb, who's uh, Director of Special Projects with the Democracy Collaborative. Uh, we'll keep this brief, uh, although Steve has done a lot of incredible work in the cooperative world uh, for many years. Uh, you know, you could read his bio. You know that Steve was a co-manager at Groundworks Books for nine years. Uh, he was the executive director of NASCO for three years in the early 2000s. And he moved on from here to become a leader with the Democracy Collaborative uh, there since 2007. Steve has been a prolific writer and thinker on a lot of important issues related to cooperatives and community development. He's written lots of interesting books about building wealth and linking communities to colleges and growing the green economy, you know, all that kind of stuff. And he really has been a leader in popularizing and really making accessible and um, giving more voice to the, the concept of community wealth building, particularly cooperatives being a, a tool for community wealth building. I know Steve um, really from when I, when I came on to um, NCDF about eight years ago. Um, Steve really, I, I think what he did for me really demonstrates what I think he's done for a lot of other folks. He, really supported me in take, stepping into that leadership role. He really supported our organization during a time of transition and change. And I think he's done that probably for a number of organizations that are in this room and out there in the world. Um, and it's made a huge difference. And, and I've been honored to know Steve since the late 90s as well when he came on as a leader with NASCO uh, just a few years after I was uh, working with NASCO as well as a volunteer and leader. And, and I think what's been incredibly valuable that I've seen in Steve's work is that he ties the work that's going on here at Institute with the work that's going on in the campuses and college settings around the country with the, the, the world that happens after campus and after college and how both we can create career paths with, these, with the interests that we build in cooperatives on our campuses and that we can find ways to make a real difference in the world outside of what sometimes feel like a bubble in the, in the campus co-op world. And so part of what I think the value that Steve brings is in many ways just making it real for us and finding practical ways that we can take the skill sets that we learn here in our cooperatives and bring them out and make a difference in the real world. And as Christina said, uh, we've both worked in community development and in, in, in wearing different, many different hats over the years. And the world of community development across the United States doesn't always know what a co-op is and doesn't really understand always the real long-term value that cooperative enterprises can bring to our efforts to stabilize neighborhoods, make our economy more equitable and just. And both while his, his time at his, as the executive director in NASCO and helping to facilitate some of the discussions around equity within NASCO, and then as, at his work as the Democracy Collaborative, he's connecting these dots and he's not just helping us to understand how the community development world can use our skills as cooperators, but helping the community development world to understand the value of cooperatives as they do their work. So without much further ado, I would like to introduce to you our, our keynote speaker this afternoon, Steve Dubb. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark and uh, Christina, for that uh, very kind introduction. And uh, it's an honor to be here. So uh, thanks also to Morgan and the board who came up with this idea of, of community wealth as the, uh, the theme of this conference and, and how co-ops can invest in community wealth and uh, for inviting me to, to speak to you today. So, um, so I'm going to try to talk about a few things, and then I'm hoping there's actually time for questions. So I don't intend to go all the way to 1.30. Um, so hopefully we, we'll, we'll have that space about how we connect co-ops uh, to community development and to the broader movement. And um, you know, one thing I think I would, I'd say just to, to start off is, you know, uh, well, I'll ask this as a question first. You know, how many people here are familiar with um, community development corporations? Okay, not, not a bad show of hands. So, um, well, I was familiar with uh, community development corporations when I worked for NASCO, too, because that's where our staff went next. 
Um, so, you know, there was really, but I didn't, but, it, you know, the reality was that NASCO at the time was very isolated from anything other than the cooperative movement. And I think that, you know, one of the, you know, we're trying to build a, a movement of movements. Uh, we, you know, we were, you know, so it's, that's really the, the challenge of our time. And, you know, it's just in a session of looking at, uh, with uh, Bob King and Ian Robinson, looking at, uh, the link between unions and cooperatives, and how do you how do you build those coalitions? And so, um, there are a lot of different ways to per, to pursue social economic justice, and different communities are going to have different preferred ways. You know, the United States and Canada are, are multi-ethnic countries with you know diverse populations, and when we're we're organizing. Not everything is going to call itself a co-op, and yet it's still really important in terms of uh, changing outcomes for, for our communities. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about my personal story. I'll talk about community wealth building, some of the challenges we face, and maybe some of the opportunities for addressing those challenges. So this is a picture of my uh, grandmother, uh, Rita Shire. She grew up in Chicago. So anybody out there from Chicago? All right, uh, and uh, she was part of the, the political machine back in the 1920s, but her, her mom was an, so my great-grandmother was an ILG organizer, and uh, Jean Debs was uh, known for giving coats out on the streets of Chicago to people who were freezing on the streets. And, and my great-grandmother, as the ILG organizer, the International Lady Garment Workers Union, uh, was responsible for collecting those coats and giving them to Gene to give out on the street. Uh, so he was a regular house guest. And I guess that's, when you think about how you connect to this work, um, we all have our different personal stories. But for me, you know, my, my interest in community wealth building, in cooperatives, comes out of that uh, secular Jewish tradition. And, uh, that may seem like a strange phrase for those of you who aren't Jewish, but um, most Jews aren't terribly observant. I'm not. Um, and one of my grandmother's favorite stories about her great-grandmother was, or my great-grandmother, her mom, uh, was that, you know, the day after her father died, uh, she mixed the dishes. So, you know, there was a shift in the culture that was going on internally, and, and a lot of labor organizers came out of that. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a, lot of this, a lot of Socialist Party supporters, you know, including, you know, you know came, came out of the Jewish community that had emigrated, uh, immigrated to the United States from Russia, from Austria, Hungary, and so forth, then from Poland. Um, and she was also an activist in her, and, you know, in her own life. Uh, uh, Rita went on to, uh, in 1942, uh, during World War II, for, formed the first public daycare in the United States. Because um, there were all these women who were now going to work in the factories who needed daycare. So that was part of her activism. Uh, she was also very active in, in the Democratic Party. And, and she used to like to tell this story. You know, one of her regrets, I suppose, was she was a delegate, or I guess an alternate, at the 1960 Democratic Convention in, Party Convention in, in Los Angeles. And um, so she was with a couple other uh, women delegates. And who would walk up right next to her uh, but Jack Kennedy? Um, and so, you know, Jack Kenny wanted to take a picture with the ladies, you know, uh, and have it, you know, for his campaign or whatever. And, and uh, Rita bolted out of there and said, I'm for Stevenson. <laughs> and she always regretted not taking that picture. But, <laughs> but um, you know, a lot of my, my, you know, and passion of this work comes out of a family tradition, out of a certain cultural orientation. And, and I think it's important to, to know where you're coming from. Um, so I went to Berkeley Student Co-op, and this is not the most laudatory picture of Berkeley Student Co-op you could find. Um, I, um, I uh, was a, a housing co-op uh, member owner at uh, Barrington Hall. That's a picture of Barrington Hall shortly after the shutdown. Um, so I was there from 1986 to 89. Um, we were in the process, you know, we, we had, there were multiple challenges at Barrington. One thing I'll say, though, is that it was an extremely creative place. It was uh, the leading organizing site of the divestment movement at Berkeley. Um, it was an artist uh, place, you know, a center for, this, for the community. Um, it had some real drug problems as well, so those were not made up. Um, and 
you know, one of the challenges, of, and so you could find fault with the Barringtonians, if you will. You could find fault with the central office. Uh, both could have behaved better. Uh, but one of the things that, that, that I learned from my experience at Barrington, I could have easily been turned off. Here I was, I put my, you know, all this energy into Barrington, you know, I did different work shifts, I did uh, grease recycling, you know, went around the different houses and picked up grease at the, in the kitchens, you know, on Sunday morning usually. I uh, did pre-breakfast cleanup. I, I was also house treasurer and part of the management team at some point uh, at the house. And we kept it going while it was there and then there was a huge transition, 10 of the 11 house level managers left the same time because of graduation and the, the co-op didn't recover. But, um, but I learned from that, ex so I could have easily been discouraged from co-ops, never joined a co-op again and so forth. What I found in it though was the value of cooperation and the necessity to build that culture of uh, cooperation and edu education constantly. Um, we cannot take our co-ops for granted. And, um, you know, it's, it's ins it was inspiring when, more than a decade later, um, some folks at Berkeley, you know, saw that old spirit of Barrington. They actually created something called the Barrington Collective. Um, I don't know if that still exists at Berkeley. You guys can tell me if it does or doesn't. But some important people came out of that for our movement, like uh, Estevan Kelly, uh, Kieran Nigam. Uh, you know, and it was really about bringing back that creative spirit, that, that commitment to education into the movement at Berkeley Student Co-op, and I think it made uh, Berkeley Student Co-op a better place. Um, but, you know, the, the other thing that, you know, I think I learned from Barrington was about uh, privilege. So there was a lot of, uh, you know, it was a lot of what we talk about doing in our co-ops to build a more diverse movement is about making the culture welcoming to people from all communities. Barrington didn't do that. And, you know, that was, the, the campus of Berkeley was different then. It was, it was a much whiter campus than it is today. Um, it was starting to become more diverse, but, it, you know, had, that transition hadn't been completed yet. Um, and so that's something that, you know, it's not really cool to not clean up your co-ops and be messy and, and, you know, bang on jars when the, the meal is late and so forth. And so I think, you know, out of that, you know, I really gained a sensitivity to, to thinking about those kind of cultural issues. Um, so here's another co-op I, I was a member of, Groundwork Books. And um, so you see this picture, UCSD Police State. So what happened at Groundwork Books in January of 1992 that would, um, I don't know if you can quite get this, um, uh, the, the whole text here, um, but, it, you know, it says, um, you know, you know, that the, co that, you know, the co-ops are um, about, uh, it leaves out the front line, but basically that the co-ops are the place where we're, um, where we create alternatives to the dominant economic system. Now, you may have joined a housing co-op and just wanted to get a cheap roof over your head. That's why I joined a housing co-op. You know, I didn't go into Barrington Hall in 1986 expecting it to be a political organization. I learned that once I was there. Um, and what happened here at, at UC San Diego was that in uh, 1991, 1992, um, they had just built a new student union. They had raised student fees to do this. And uh, they had also financed part of the new student union at UC San Diego uh, with debt from the, what was then the campus-owned bookstore that competed against the co-ops. And the campus-owned bookstore was losing money. And so they thought it would be a swell idea to abrogate the leases they had to the, the student co-ops that were in the old student union and, and force them off campus. And so on January 15th, 1992, at a roundabout uh, 3.30, no, it was like 1.30 in the morning, uh, the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs and about five or six campus police officers, they had an emergency key they set off the alarm of the store and basically broke into the store and changed the locks. Um, the students did not respond to this kindly. Uh, there was a, the, neither did the alarm company, which, you know, the, the, the assistant vice chancellor actually tried to impersonate a co-op employee and claim he was somebody else. He didn't have the, co the passcode and that didn't work. Um, so I remember getting a call at three in the morning and 
about 50 of us did. So we were, by, by 3.30 in the morning, about 50 of us were, you know, they broke a window to get into their own store. We hired somebody at 7.30 a.m. to fix the window, rekeyed the locks back to the old keys, and opened for business. Um, it didn't end there, though, because at about 10 a.m., uh, the uh, assistant vice chancellor came back with the campus police to kick everybody out. And then, uh, you know, fairly spontaneously, mind you, we've been doing a lot of organizing, a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings, but we didn't know this was going to happen. Um, you know, hundreds of people started appearing around the, the windows. And the, uh, the political quote of the day was, the, the, the assistant vice chancellor's name was Tommy Tucker. So that, that helps to know this. Um, and, and so the, the, the political uh, claim that was being made is, hey, Tommy, I want a Coke. So not terribly, not terribly anti-capitalist. People wanted their, you know, it's a snack food store and it sold Cokes, it sold cigarettes, it sold uh, uh, cameras, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but hundreds of people were banging on the windows. So happened that we had rekeyed the building. The campus police didn't realize this. Uh, the uh, general manager was also a bodybuilder for the co-op, you know, so he's like 6'5", 240, what have you, right? And so he opened the door, the police ran out the other door. And then we had to go to the Superior Court to get a restraining order to, pro to prevent, prohibit campus administrators from entering the student co-op stores on their campus. And that was granted. <laughs> so, um, so I learned you had to fight tremendous odds. Um, we also had to then negotiate a new lease agreement with our landlord, which unfortunately was still the university. Um, and we tried to politicize it the best we could. We said the buildings really should be owned by the students because they paid for them. This is morally correct. Unfortunately, it's not legally correct. Um, and, and so we, but we did manage to do that. And I'm happy to say that there is no uh, you know, uh, boarded up uh, windows at the UCSD co-ops are still functioning today. So this is me at uh, NASCO Institute, the new uh, executive director of NASCO back in 2000. So I think my hair was a different color then, but I'm not sure. I don't really recognize that person on the screen, but... Um, and... You know, I'll say a little bit about my work at NASCO, and I, you know, I think, you know, maybe there were, I'll, I'll just give like three big things in this will sort of, one was that when I got to NASCO in 2000, um, how many, we'll do a guess, how many, how many members of the board of directors of NASCO do you think were people of color in 2000? Yeah, so a couple of people got it right. Yeah, zero. Um, which was shocking coming from California, where I'd never experienced that. Um, and, and so we, you know, that was actually, you know, I can, I'll, take a, I'll, I'll take credit in not standing in the way. Um, you know, there was a People of Color caucus formed by the maybe 10 or 12 people of color that were at NASCO Institute that year, and they made a serious demands, and, and we took them seriously and were able to start changing the culture. That's an ongoing process, I assume, still. Um, and um, so that was, you know, the other thing we tried to do was really get out into the field. So NASCO had been sort of a little bit this, well, there's a NASCO office, and then we have an institute, but we made real emphasis on doing member visits, and so Anjanette Bunce uh, and I probably managed to visit, we actually managed to visit every single member co-op every year between the two of us. Um, and that was important in terms of, and you know, with uh, some assist from Tracy Citrin, who's on development staff, and Jim Jones, who's uh, maybe around here somewhere, I don't see Jim, but oh, there he is. <laughs> hey, Jim. Um, and uh, but we we made we thought it was important, and I think this is still important that community building. In the session we were in, you know, what's the most effective way to increase engagements with your members? And the answer is the same, even in 2015, even with Facebook, even with Twitter, even with all that social media. Right? It's one-on-one -on -one conversations. It's talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. That's still the most important thing. And so NASCO is a network, and, and it's as strong as those one-on-one -on -one conversations make that network. Um, so I'm moving on to uh, community wealth building. And, and hopefully this is a useful concept for thinking about 
not just being cooperatives, but being part of a broader movement that is trying to build wealth in low-income communities and is trying to um, you know, have a social vision because there are co-ops, I mean, I know this is hard to believe, um, but there are co-ops that don't have a very strong social mission. Um, and so it's important to not just say you're a co-op and be done, but to actually think about what your social justice impact is. Um, so this is community wealth building sub of term we helped develop. It means it's a place-based strategy for improving specific communities and, and doing development without displacement. Um, and it's focused on values of equity and inclusion, uh, local ownership, and, you know, it's important to note that, that you know, 1% of the population in the United States owns roughly 50% of all what you would call investable assets. And the numbers in Canada are a little better, but not that much better. So, you know, we've, we've gotten an extraordinary concentration of, of wealth that we need to change. We need to seize that economic space. Um, you know, one of the things the student co-ops at UC San Diego were doing, or what I do, you know, I'm now on the board of uh, COFED, Cooperative Food Empowerment Directive. And what are you trying to do? You're trying to reclaim space, you know, so that, the, that the, you don't have all these, it wasn't always normal uh, in college campuses to have McDonald's and Wendy's and Round Table and Starbucks on your campuses. They used to actually be local businesses. Um, and, uh, you know, student co-ops are one form of that business where you can, in, in fact, directly own those businesses. And that's, I think, part of the game, is to seize that economic space, to reclaim that ex economic space as democratically controlled. Um, this focus on living wage jobs, uh, keeping wealth local, and really this idea of uh, ecosystem that it's not just about your business, it's about the conjunction of business and community-based organizations that work together to create a, a more just and e equitable system. So no one co-op, no one CDC, no one social enterprise is going to change that system alone. Um, and I'll use this, just mention this last phrase, asset, local assets. So there's a, this is rooted in a theoretical approach called asset-based uh, community development, or ABCD. Uh, it's at Northwestern University, so those of you in Chicago can cheer again if you want. <laughs> I realize it's actually Evanston, but close enough, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, abcdinstitute.org is a good website to check out. It's really that instead of thinking about solving problems, it's about building on strengths. And, you know, and because there's so much strength in, in communities and, and we have so much to learn from each other. Um, so these are just some examples of different types of operations. Uh, Market Creek Plaza in San Diego is a mixed ownership uh, it's a supermarket sort of uh, shopping center area where there's individual owners from the local neighborhood. They actually did a, a direct purchase uh, IPO type of a, a situation where people could buy in. You had to be in the neighborhood in order to have an ownership stake. So they made it lo locally controlled and the rest is owned by a local foundation that reinvests in the community. Um, on the right there, I think you see uh, the Prospera uh, Co uh, cooperatives, which are a set of uh, uh, Latina house cleaning co-ops in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, on the lower left is a group of Native American uh, organizations that we're working with at the Democracy Collaborative. And, and then on the right, you see some pictures of the, some co-ops that we helped develop in Cleveland. These are multi-stakeholder cooperatives, 80% worker-owned, 20% nonprofit-owned. The nonprofit reinvests in further development of co-ops. Um, and you see on the left, the, the lower left it's center, uh, the lawn, a laundry co-op that does about, can do about 10 million pounds of laundry a year. In the middle you see a solar panel, there's a solar and energy services co-op uh, that's added two megawatts of power to uh, Cleveland. And on the right uh, is a greenhouse, um, which uh, you know, grow, can grow about three million head of lettuce, a few hundred thousand pounds of herbs. This employs about 120 people uh, linked to the supply chain of uh, the local hospitals, universities, and other, other major purchasers. And it's not just in Cleveland where you're starting to see an idea that five years ago, if, if I had talked to an economic development officer of any city and said, you should be investing in worker co-ops, they would have said, you're crazy. Um, but now it's happening in New York, it's happening in Madison, it's happening in Cleveland, it's happening uh, 
you know, it, it may soon happen in Washington, D.C. There's efforts in Philadelphia. This is starting to take hold, starting to take hold in Oakland. Um, and you can see in one year, they were able to create 141 worker owner positions. Um, anyone want to guess the, the multi million dollar budget of this effort? Somebody shout out a number. 1.2. So it's pretty good. When you think about it, there's $80 billion that's spent on economic development initiative, incentives in the United States. Some of the largest recipients are folks like Walmart. They get over a billion a year in taxpayer subsidies. Um, you may have heard of Boeing Corporation. They get $500 million a year. That's guaranteed for the next 16 years from the state of Washington uh, in order to keep jobs where they already were. That's what they got paid to do. Um, and so we, we throw money at private corporations and the goal, so one million, now it's two million. They doubled it this year in New York because of these results. We're, we have a little ways to go, <laughs> but we can start seeing maybe a path towards a different economic system that favors community development as opposed to corporate development. Um, Want to throw out uh, community land trusts. Uh, how many folks here are familiar with community land trusts? Okay. A few of you, good. Not, um, so this is a way of holding land in trust as a nonprofit with the, the actual houses being owned by the residents. What it does is allows for permanently affordable housing and it's a you know, very strong defense against gentrification. The trick is to plan in advance. So if you're in Detroit or you're in Cleveland or you're in Buffalo or um, Syracuse or Rochester or any of those cities, um, you know, uh, buy the land now. Don't wait until the prices quadruple like it did in Washington, D.C. You know, nobody believed that Washington, D.C. would develop, um, and it did. And it's, ha it's, you know, now I was just talking to somebody at a conference about Pittsburgh. It's like, yep, we should, we were saying this five years ago. We knew we needed to do it. Nobody would do it. So it's really important to plan for economic development. There is a shift coming because of energy costs that are in the long term going to go up. So we see this in Europe, we see this in Latin America, the wealthy live in the cities, the poor live in the suburbs. That will happen here too. And, and we better plan for it. Uh, social enterprise. So I, I love this one, DC Central Kitchen. So from my uh, adopted hometown, I grew up in, in California, but now in Washington, DC. And what they do is they hire people who have come out of uh, prison and they give them job training in culinary field. They run a business that helps finance their operations and they actually buy seconds from local farmers, which they would otherwise be plowed under. Um, and the, you know, so there's healthy food in the schools, the farmers are making more money and people are getting jobs instead of going back to prison. And that's what that 350% return on investment means. They're spending about $600,000 on their job training program. They're saving the district at least $2 million in likely, you know, statistically normal cost for recidivism. And uh, this again is our work in Cleveland. It's a schematic. You can see the idea is to have a systemic approach. So it uses foundation funding as a, as a source of capital to get started. And, also of expertise and connections and networks. Um, it, develop, it provides technical assistance and you create worker-owned businesses that are link with the community. Um, and, and we see this as sort of a way of jump-starting a Mondragon-like model. Um, let's see, I should ask this too. How many people know Mondragon? Okay, so pretty good. Uh, so largest worker co-op system in, in the world, right? 80,000 employees. Um, and uh, over 120 network cooperatives. And, uh, and it started with a Catholic church diocese uh, uh, and uh, five graduates from a technical college in 1956. So it started small. It took a while to build it up. 1956 is close to 60 years ago, well, 59, right? Um, uh, but you can tell that from the small seeds, great things can grow. And we believe whether it happens in Cleveland or happens in New York or happens in Madison or happens in Chicago or Los Angeles or San Francisco, that this, is, this needs to happen. We need to be building these networks of, uh, that are linked. And by tapping into the anchor institutions, 
what you're doing. So these hospitals and universities, we forget this, that they're publicly owned or they're nonprofit owned. They have a public mission. You know, University of Michigan has a public mission. It's to serve the state of Michigan. Um, and so if they think about their spending not as a normal business, and let's be honest, most of their trustees are from the corporate world. They think like the corporate world. But the actual mission of a place like this or the places that maybe some of you attend um, is to serve the community. And this goes back to something in 1862 called the Land-Grant College Act, which was signed by, into law by Abraham Lincoln. It's not a new idea, uh, but we, you know, we have to organize to make it a reality. Um, and this, I wanted to show, it, I wanted to show an example from, from north of the border. Uh, so this is in uh, Winnipeg, and uh, it's Nietzsche Commons, which is a combined um, restaurant and food co-op and craft store uh, that's all native owned and worker owned and run. Uh, so you can do some pretty amazing things in, in low-income communities that, you know, that this now employs 60 people and has $3 million of business opened in 2013. Uh, there was a smaller store that existed beforehand, but they've just scaled up. And uh, some food for thought. So this is just a study of the 16-county region of Northeast Ohio. And they, they, they did a, just a you know, economic analysis. What would happen if we, sh if we even, you know, if we reduced the amount of food we imported from 98% to 75%? And the answer was we would create 27,000 jobs in the community. And, and, and also, you know, employ a lot of the unemployed and increase the, the, the output of the region by several billion dollars. So these principles have, you know, real impact if, if applied seriously. Um, and key to making this work is building economic capacity. So the work that you do in your co-ops, the co-op education work, whether it's study circles, um, you know, identif you know, building networks of peer mentors, going on learning journeys, visiting other co-ops or other institutions, is really critical uh, to your own education and to making your institutions function better, as well as building a broader movement. And, you know, I'll mention this community cultural translator. So, you know, I first encountered this um, when I was doing some research on community college partnerships. And, uh, you know, so the, it was, I was work, doing some research at Yale University. And um, they, um, they wanted to work with the, the K-12 schools. And, and they had to hire somebody who actually was from the K-12 schools in order to be able to do that, because you have to be able to speak school. So there's, there's actual languages, but there's also, you know, the subcultures within our community. And this is true, too, when, when Syracuse University wanted to develop a community. Believe it or not, uh, there was a lot of mistrust of Syracuse University. Why do you care about our community all of a sudden? You haven't cared about it for the last 50, 60 years. Um, and so finding people who could operate both in the university world, but were trusted by the community is critical to making those bridges happen and making those partnerships work. Um, so, so that's a little bit on community wealth building and the approach and the focus on education and on ecosystem development. Uh, we do have a few challenges. <laughs> um, you know, they're environmental challenges. So we know we have to, as a nation, reduce carbon emissions by something like 80 or 90 percent by 2050. This is even harder than it sounds. Energy is everything we do. And so it's a huge transformation, a huge challenge. And some of the things we do are just completely out of sync um, with achieving that goal. So if, if you allow a company to move from, so take, uh, we're not too far from Detroit here, right? That's a city that used to have 2 million people and now has 700,000. So what, what happened to the 1.3 million people that moved? And mind you, the population of the country has doubled in that time, right? Um, well, you had to build new houses, new sewer lines, new build office buildings, new everything, new roads, new subways, what have you. That's not energy efficient. And so thinking about st stabilizing employment, stabilizing jobs, stabilizing communities is really critical to that work. Um, you know, uh, another challenge, you know, is wealth inequality. And maybe you've seen charts like this, but it's, it's kind of stunning, these numbers. So you, you could, there's almost, you could fit 400 people in this room, right? And if you took the Forbes 400 list of people, they would have 2.29 trillion, that's over 5 billion per person, in net worth. 
And if you compare that to the bottom three quintiles, as they say, 60% of the United States population, that net worth is about 1.2 trillion. So much less. This is a number, so I work with a colleague at the Democracy Collaborative named Gar Alperwitz, and uh, he, he used to call this a medieval number. And then, you know, he was on a book tour a couple of years ago, and there was a medieval historian in the audience. And, uh, you know, the guy got up at, at the book tour and, and stood up and asked the question, said, you know, uh, Dr. Alperwitz, uh, I, I, I hate to contradict you, but I'm a, I'm a student of medieval history, and, you know, the Lord's never had it so good. Um, it's not just about money, though. It's about life and death, literally. So this is in Cleveland, Ohio, where we do a lot of our work, right? Um, on the, let's see, the left side of the screen there, you can see Huff. And the life expectancy there is 64 years. You go eight miles to the east, white suburb of Lyndhurst, 88 years. 24 year difference in life expectancy in eight miles. Mind you too that Huff is near a, a small hospital you might have heard of. It was mentioned in the 2012 presidential debate, uh, the Cleveland Clinic. You know, employs 35,000 people, considered one of the top five, maybe even top two hospitals in the United States. And right outside their door, you have a, a community with a life expectancy of 64 years, never having recovered from, uh, you know, the 1967 uprisings and so forth that, that uh, decimated Cleveland. Um, and, and what this tells you also, and this is important for thinking about community development, is that health itself uh, does not depend really on health care as much as it depends on things like having a roof over your head, a job, uh, you know, safe environment, you know, those kind of social and environmental factors are responsible for 80% of health outcomes. Whether you see a doctor or not, whether you have insurance or not, that's only 20%. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about my, my hometown of D.C. So this was in a profile. It was, a, it was the, so the, the quote is, in the 1980s, nobody lived east of DuPont Circle. So I don't know how many people have been to Washington, D.C. Okay, there's a bit of real estate uh, east of DuPont Circle, like about three quarters of the city. Um, so how is it possible that nobody lived east of DuPont Circle in the 1980s? What happened to those 500,000 people? Um, and of course, what this really means, and by the way, this was said by a leading real estate developer. He's probably a Democrat. He's sometimes known as Mr. Georgetown. And he just actually moved from Georgetown into east of the DuPont Circle, um, into one of his real estate developments, I think. Um, and, um, but, but, you know, so, the, the, the quest, so, so structural racism isn't just about active prejudice, it's about invisibility, you know. And so, you know, I have the sign from the 63 March on Washington there on the, on the right. Um, this, this, this was in 2013, 50 years later, and, and we're still not seeing the majority of citizens in this country. And it's a huge challenge. And, you know, I, I think it comes down to when you think about the question of, you know, if you were to ask yourself, I could have done this as an exercise, um, you know, what, what, do you, what do you picture in your mind when you hear the term American? Is that a white person? Is it a person of color? You know, for the overwhelming majority of white Americans, at least, it's certainly a white person, certainly what's for this person. And, and that we have to be able to identify everyone as part of the community um, if we're going to actually move the dial on, the, and, on these numbers. So uh, this is the next system project uh, that we launched earlier this year, which tries to ask the question, if you don't like uh, state socialism, like the Soviet Union back in the day, uh, and you don't like corporate capitalism, what, what are you going to do? You know, if, if we don't think the system right now works, what are you going to do? And, and we have some ideas of principles. Um, I don't think we have answers. Um, that you, that co-ops and other forms of economic democracy are critical. That you um, have decentralization of, of uh, you know, try to make decisions at the most local level possible. Um, that you try to do, uh, that you focus on rebuilding a sense of community that's been lost in so many of our cities. Um, 
and, uh, and, that you have, uh, and that you do have a role for economic planning. And we do planning today, we just don't think of it as planning. The, the Pentagon is a plan. It's a large agency that spends federal resources on, supposedly on our behalf and has, you know, famously employs people in every congressional district in the country, right? It's a plan. It's just not the right plan. And so we need to be thinking about that. And really quickly, a little bit on our work. Uh, you know, so we're working with, uh, this is Pine Ridge and what there is now. And this is what they hope to create uh, on Pine Ridge. You know, one of the lowest, poorest, it's a Native American reservation, Lakota Sioux, um, estimated household income of 8,000. And they were able to come up with this sustainable community plan that they're now implementing. Uh, they, they called their process Oyate Omnisie, which means, you know, circle meetings of the people. So they came at it through a consensus building process of the entire community. And one thing they're going to do is they're going to build it themselves. They're going to actually create a housing cooperative that's going to help do the construction, not just here, but off the reservation as well, employing people and starting to change those statistics. Um, and some of the techniques we use are to break down and have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. This guy on the right is uh, the head of Native American Bank based in uh, Longmont, Colorado, and he's meeting with uh, somebody who's working with Little Earth of United Tribes, an Indian Preference Section 8 project in uh, Minneapolis. And we bring people as a group to meet with uh, social entrepreneurs, cooperators, and, and with folks who have access to capital because the talent is in the communities. All we're trying to do is build, help build those networks to make that change happen. So with that, uh, I want to wrap up and uh, look forward to your questions. Thanks so much. So I don't know how we're doing the Q&A. You can... All right, we have about five minutes for questions. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. You must speak into the microphone so that the captionist can pick it up. So, who has a question for Steve? That was a lot to absorb, so <laughs> if it takes a second, that's okay. While, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll, I'll plug our panel, which is at uh, 2.45, and I won't be speaking at all other than to ask questions, but we'll have uh, Christina Jennings, who introduced uh, me along with Mark, as well as Daniel Price, who's with a group called Neighborhood Connections uh, that's doing uh, network-based organizing in Cleveland, Aaron Bartley from Push Buffalo, uh, which is doing uh, both uh, social enterprise and some worker co-op development and housing work. Um, and um, now I'm going to forget one. This is really bad. Uh, and uh, Rebecca Noel uh, from uh, Milwaukee uh, that's doing co-op organizing there. So, um, but I hope to get a couple questions here. This looks like there's some hands in that. <laughs> I'll get it later. Question. Hi. Um, you talked about uh, the relationship between like community organizers and the university, and I was wondering um, if Democracy Collaborative does their own research or pairs with the university or a university. No, we do our own research, and we have a lot. Of, if sure. you go to um, either of those websites, there you'll find most of those are, are downloadable for free. Hey, uh, Steve. So, question. Do you think that the greater challenge will be from the outside in terms of getting institutions who don't understand co-ops to understand co-ops, or from the inside, getting people who are aligned with the movement to work together? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the short answer is yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I think that the, the greater, I mean, I do think there's a lot of obstacles in terms of turf and, and, you know, one thing, you know, one, one interesting fact that, you know, I, I think the greater challenge is external, but I'll say this about the internal challenge. Um, you know, there's a reason why uh, civil rights movement ended up organizing into things like community development corporations and not cooperatives. And that was because the Ford Foundation, the federal government fu funded community development corporations and not cooperatives. Um, <laughs> So you know, there's, so there's a, so you know, there's been 
So as a result, um, for example, uh, the worker co-op movement, which has made tremendous strides in the last few years, to the extent that now the majority of new worker co-op development actually is in communities of color. Uh, but, you know, for a long time, it was living down that white hippie counterculture ethic, which you could see so well, I think, in that photo of uh, Barrington Hall, right? That was the ethic. Um, and, and so that is a challenge that we have to continue to work on internally to make sure that uh, we're listening and humble and inviting of, of others. Um. So when we're looking around at uh, student movements across the globe, um, for example, in Chile where they just won free public college education and in South Africa where they had you know, tens of thousands of students shutting down their national universities over fee increases, in your grandest vision, how do you think um, student co-ops in this country kind of fit into that context and can enhance that kind of uh, viral quality of movements? Mm. Uh, another tough question, good question. Uh, you know, I think one, one interesting thing, and I, uh, I'm not endorsing any political candidates here, but uh, the fact that um, Bernie Sanders has made free public education a political issue is a big deal. And, and there should be mass organizing around that because what we've created uh, very clearly in the United States is a, is a two-tier society, right? You know, so we, we can forget that the majority, you know, like all economic development is focused on high tech, biotech. Guess what? The majority of um, adult Americans, the majority, never went, never, you know, never completed college. Maybe some, maybe we're getting close to where half have at least a two year degree. But if, if we think that, um, so, you know, we, so, and when we, what the data show, this is college board data, it shows that if you're in the uh, top quartile, academically, but the bottom quartile uh, economically, you're less likely to go to college than the person who's in the bottom quartile academically, but top quartile economically. That's horrible. You know, so we've, we've created a, a, you know, a system that's, you know, in the name of meritocracy is anything, anything but, and, and really exclusionary to more and more people who don't want to have to take on $40,000 of debt just for public higher education tuition to say nothing of housing, living costs, all of that, that, that that's involved. Uh, so I, I, I would hope there's a social movement there. All right. Are there any questions from anyone less on the man-dude side of the spectrum? <laughs> Great. Um, you said that you're on the board of directors for COFED, and I was wondering um, what COFED is and what it's doing now. Sure. So uh, COFED is Cooperative Food Empowerment Directive, and what it's trying to do is create uh, food co-ops and dining co-ops on college campuses. Uh, it had an institute this summer, uh, and rather than trying to be all things to all people, the decision was to go deep with a small number of groups. So there were eight teams uh, that were there and uh, schools like Howard University and uh, I think Temple and UC Santa Barbara and UCLA. Um, and uh, you know, the, the goal is to really build a, a strong support system of technical assistance so that you can start showing that food co-ops can be viable businesses on campus and, and spread that culture of healthy eating, which you know, is another huge challenge if you look at obesity rates, diabetes incidents, and so forth in this country. So that's, that's what we're working on. All right, one more question. Great. Hi, so um, I don't really have, well, I guess I can frame it as a question, but um, so we're talking about the social political side of it, and I'm wondering as the cooperative movement looks for social outlets of like standing in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and um, actions we can move forward as, as the space that NASCO gives us. So it's I'm not really a question. So how, how, how should the co-ops uh, coordinate with Black Lives Matter or the movement for 15 or those kind of things? Is that the Right, question? right. So all these social platforms that already exist mm -hmm. um, and kind of like, 
I guess, looking for outlets in there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, if there's one theme that I hopefully got through, it's about, you know, I don't care if you call it community wealth building or solidarity economy or whatever term you want to use, but it does move from just cooperation among cooperation, cooperatives, which is important, you know, to solidarity. And so I think one thing that, you know, many of you are in housing co-ops, and one of the underestimated resources of housing co-ops is space. You know, you have physical space to hold meetings. You have physical space to organize. It's not an accident that the investment movement was largely organized at Barrington Hall. Um, you know, that was, a that was a physical place where people knew to come. And I think making your, your, your actual house, opening your homes, you know, to those movements, listening to them, figuring out where you can add value is, is, is really uh, critical work. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for your questions, and thank you again, Steve.